I'm still looking for news, say, about the youngster. She going to be all right? Yes, Jerry. No tragic ending this time. This little girl's going to get well, thanks to Dr. Hartley here. Well, you're too generous, Doctor. Uh -huh. Well, the real life saving was done before she got to the hospital. Well, I don't get it, Doctor. What's the story? Here's what I mean, Jerry. The real hero is somebody whose name you and I will never know. The good Samaritan that gave that little girl first aid at the scene of the accident. Yes, Jerry. That person was one in a thousand. Well, but people always try to help. That is, most of them do. Now, you can't expect... Yes, to... I know, Jerry. Most people are willing to help. But that alone isn't enough. It takes something more than just willingness to save a life. <laughs> well, after all, we can't all be doctors. Well, you don't have to be. But if everyone who is willing to help in an accident or emergency were armed with just a little, well... Just the bare, basic essentials of first aid, a great many lives would be saved. If everyone, if you, and you, and you, and you, would take the time to learn what to do before the doctor arrives. Know what to look for, know what to do, know how to do it. These are the essentials of first aid. Now let's see how these principles apply. First, in regard to wounds. A sharp-edged knife. A broken bottle. A sharp piece of metal. A shattered windshield. Near but a few of the causes of wounds. Wounds that bleed. Bleeding can be fatal, but it can be stopped effectively with simple first aid treatment. There are two main types of bleeding that can occur. Bleeding from arteries and bleeding from veins. To recognize each type, you should know how the blood circulates in the body. The heart acts as a pumping station. The right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs. In the lungs, the blood picks up oxygen, which is necessary to sustain life. The blood then returns to the left side of the heart, where it is pumped to all parts of the body through a system of tubes known as arteries. Then through a network of tiny blood vessels called capillaries, and back again to the heart through another system of vessels, the veins. When one of the arteries is cut, bleeding is serious. Have you ever seen the way water spurts from a hand pump? Well, that is the way blood spurts from an artery which has been cut. Blood spurts with force from the wound each time the heart beats. This type of bleeding must be stopped quickly to save life. In most cases, bleeding can be stopped effectively by simple first aid measures, such as pressure applied directly on the wound. If this does not stop the bleeding, apply finger pressure, sometimes called digital pressure, between the heart and the wound. Another way is to use a tourniquet, similarly placed. Both methods compress and close off the artery. In all cases of serious bleeding, be sure to call the doctor. To return to digital pressure, there are several points on each side of the body where the arteries lie close to a bone. It's at these points where pressure is most effective. 
Arterial bleeding can be controlled on the scalp and on the upper portion of the head by finger pressure just in front of the middle portion of the ear. This stops the escape of blood from the artery serving this particular area. Blood flowing from a cut artery in the lower portion of the face may be controlled by pressure on the underside of the jawbone, just in front of the angle of the jaw. This cuts off the supply of blood to this portion of the face. Arterial bleeding from the neck can be controlled by pressure on the bleeding side of the neck. Anchor the thumb against the nape of the neck and with the fingers press alongside the windpipe toward the spinal column. Care must be taken not to press against the windpipe. For bleeding around the shoulder or armpit, bend the head slightly toward the bleeding side and bring firm pressure to bear with the thumb behind the center of the collarbone. The flow through this artery will thus be effectively controlled. Arterial bleeding of the arm at any point below the armpit may be controlled by pressure on the blood vessel against the bone of the upper arm, thus compressing the artery and checking the flow of blood. If an artery is cut in the leg or thigh, bleeding may be stopped by pressing firmly against the thigh bone high up on the inner side of the thigh, thus shutting off the blood supply to the limb below this point. When bleeding from the arm or leg cannot be controlled by digital pressure, use a tourniquet. A triangular bandage folded into a cravat makes an excellent tourniquet, as does a roller bandage. Stocking, large handkerchief, even a necktie will do if nothing else is available. But never use anything such as a wire, a rope, which may cut into the skin and cause injury. When using a tourniquet, direct pressure on the artery is desirable. A small roll of bandage or folded gauze is excellent for this purpose. Never use anything hard or with sharp edges. Better to apply the tourniquet without a pad at all. Tuck the roll of bandage or pad directly over the artery. Wrap whatever material you are using for a tourniquet around the limb twice. Tie a loose knot. Place a short stick over this knot. And tie it securely in place. Now turn the stick so that the tourniquet tightens. Twist the stick only enough to stop the bleeding. This causes the pad to press firmly against the artery, forming a barrier past which the blood cannot flow. A tourniquet must be loosened at regular intervals of 15 minutes to avoid permanent damage to the tissues. If bleeding starts again, tighten the tourniquet. Remember to loosen the tourniquet every 15 minutes and tighten it again only if bleeding resumes. A condition known as shock may be present in all injuries and very frequently in severe bleeding. The vital functions of the body are slowed down. Shock may result in death. Therefore, while waiting for the doctor, treat the victim for shock immediately after stopping the bleeding. A person in shock is pale, has a cold, clammy skin, weak, rapid pulse, and breathes irregularly. Keep him quiet, lying down, warm him, Wrap him completely in blankets, or a coat, or anything to keep him warm. Apply hot water bottles, carefully wrapped, bags of heated sand or salt. Take care, though, that you don't overdo it and burn the injured. Another thing to remember in treating shock is position. Keep the body flat, and raise the foot of the bed, cot, or stretcher, so the head is lower than the rest of the body. If the injured is lying on something that cannot be raised, keep its feet, legs, and thighs raised. Keep him lying quietly, and unless he coughs up blood 
or has difficulty in breathing or has nosebleed, don't allow him to sit up. At this point, stimulants are important. One of the most effective is aromatic spirits of ammonia. One teaspoonful in one half glass of water. Hot coffee or tea also are excellent stimulants and are valuable in supplying heat. If he is unconscious, never try to force him to drink. An unconscious person may be revived by using a stimulant which can be inhaled, such as ammonia inhaled, or aromatic spirits of ammonia on a handkerchief. Simply hold the handkerchief near the nose for a few seconds, or use smelling salts. Shock may be avoided if these steps are taken in time. So, those are the important things for you to do for a person suffering from shock. Keep him warm, keep him lying quietly on his back with his head lower than his feet, and give him stimulants. Well, these things sound simple, and they are. But these simple first aid steps, taken before the doctor comes, have saved many lives. Now let's go back and take up the second type of bleeding, a wound in which a vein is cut. Now here's the circulatory system again. You have seen how the heart pumps blood through the arteries to all parts of the body. However, on the return trip, the blood flows back to the heart through the other set of vessels, the veins. Remember how an arterial wound bleeds? Spurting with a lot of pressure behind it. A wound in which a vein is cut bleeds quite differently. Blood escapes in a slow, steady stream and with much less force. The best way to stop this type of bleeding is by direct pressure on the bleeding point with a sterile dressing. Dressings are usually made of gauze and are available in various sizes so that any room, large or small, can be completely covered. Because they come in direct contact with the wound, dressings should be sterile, that is, free of bacteria. Sterile compresses are available in sealed, dust-proof packages to prevent contamination. The compress is placed directly over the wound and should be large enough to cover the entire wound. The bandage is applied to hold the compress in place. There are a variety of bandages suitable for all parts of the body. A very useful bandage for first aid work is the triangular bandage, which is merely a 36 or 40 inch square of cloth folded into a triangle or cut diagonally into two triangles. This can be used to hold a compress in place on the head, scalp, or face. To hold large dressings in place, as for example, on the chest. To place over injuries of the hand or foot. To bandage the shoulder and upper arm. When folded as a cravat, it can be used to tie splints in place. It can also be used as an arm sling and, of course, as a tourniquet. Do not apply a triangular bandage directly over a wound. Many times a roller bandage may be used where a triangular bandage is not available. This type of bandage can be used to hold a sterile compress or dressing in place, to hold splints in place, as a sling for the arm, and as a tourniquet. Likewise, the roller bandage may be used in injuries to the arm, to bandage an injured hand, in wounds of the leg, the ankle, or foot, to bandage the shoulder and chest, and in wounds of the head. When using a roller bandage, hold it this way and don't allow much of it to unroll at one time. In this manner, you will always have control of it. 
All of us keep in mind that any bandage should be applied firmly enough to keep the compress in place, yet not so tight that it tends to stop the circulation of the blood. For minor wounds, the adhesive compress bandage proves very convenient and has many uses. Be sure to remove the protective covering from the adhesive ends and do not touch the sterile gauze pad with the fingers. There are other types of injuries which also require dressings and sometimes bandaging. Among these are burns. Steering steam. Boiling water. Fire. A hot stove. These are a few of the familiar causes of painful burns and scalds. In the case of burns, there are several important things to do. Treat for shock, dress the burn, and call for a doctor. In severe burns after treating for shock, remove all loose clothing over the burn. If any of the clothing sticks to the burn skin, cut around it, but don't tear it off. Get medical attention at once. If ordinary baking soda or bicarbonate of soda is available, make a solution or a paste with tepid water. If there is some water which has already been boiled, use that. Apply the solution or paste gently over a burn. Bandage very lightly and carefully. If baking soda and the other approved burn preparation is not available, cover burns with a sterile dressing, bandage lightly, and wait for the doctor. Uh, here are just a few don'ts. Try not to break open a blister, and don't apply to a burn cotton, iodine, oils, or greases. But first aid treatment isn't limited to dressing a wound or a burn or stopping the flow of blood. A person who knows first aid can be of help in cases of unconsciousness. An overturned canoe, a running engine behind closed garage door, a hissing gas jet, a live electric wire, these tell what to look for. Now, if in such cases breathing has stopped, the person may die. But given artificial respiration immediately, his breathing may be restored and his life saved. Now, here's the proper way to give artificial respiration. Loosen tight clothing. To roll him over, place one arm over his head, bend the other arm at the elbow, and place the back of his hand beside his mouth. Roll him so that his head comes to rest on that hand. Turn his head outward so that the nose and mouth are left free for breathing. Make sure the mouth is clear and unobstructed. Remove dental plates or any substances which may restrict breathing. If the tongue has fallen backward, pull it forward. Straddle the victim's Thigh. Now place the palms of your hands on the victim's back. Your fingers should follow the curve of the ribs with a little finger right over the lowest rib. Place your knees below his hip bones so that when you lean forward, your shoulders are directly over the small of his back. Be sure to assume a comfortable position. Swing forward slowly and without bending your elbows, Apply the weight of your body gradually on the victim. Now this is step one of artificial respiration and should take about two seconds or the time you can count four. Thus, one, two, three, four. Now release the pressure by swinging back away from the victim. This is step two. This completes one cycle 
and should take about five seconds if done properly. Artificial respiration should be given in a continuous operation and with the proper timing. One, two, three, four. Remember the old song? Out goes the bad air, in comes the good air. Out goes the bad air, in comes the good air. In some cases, it is well worthwhile to continue this treatment for several hours before giving up hope. If you become tired, have someone else take over, taking care that the rhythm is not interrupted or changed. Watch the victim carefully when his natural breathing returns. Recovery may be only temporary, and he may again stop breathing. When this happens, resume artificial respiration immediately. Treat the victim for shock as soon as possible. And when he is breathing normally, Give him a stimulant and keep him lying quietly until the doctor arrives. Now remember in giving first aid to a person whose breathing has stopped, start artificial respiration promptly. Not too forcibly, not too rapidly, but with a definite rhythm. Call for an inhalator if available. And now we come to fractures, broken bone, a rickety or broken step ladder. A carelessly placed toy, a bit of torn carpeting, stepping between parked cars. These are but a few of the causes resulting in fractures of bones. When a bone is broken, it may be either a simple or a compound fracture. Now here's the difference. Here's an x-ray of a simple fracture. The bone is broken, but the skin has not been pierced. The area around the broken bone is usually quite tender and painful. Within a short time, it'll become discolored and swollen. Now, here is an x-ray of a compound fracture, more serious than a simple fracture. There is a connecting wound to the surface in the immediate vicinity of the break. Bleeding may be severe. A tourniquet may be needed. When you suspect a fracture, call a doctor immediately. Then treat the victim for shock and make him comfortable. And finally, if he must be moved or if a doctor isn't available, apply a splint. If it's a compound fracture, stop any bleeding and dress the wound and apply a splint as in simple fracture. The purpose of a splint is to hold the limb in a rigid position and prevent movement which might aggravate the injury. An effective splint is the so-called fixed traction type. A tourniquet is often placed around the injured member to be ready for use if bleeding occurs. For emergency purposes, in the absence of a traction splint, a board, a roll of newspapers, a pillow, or an umbrella may serve as a splint. Regardless of the material used for splinting, it should extend beyond the joints, above and below the fracture. If possible, it should also be wide enough to give adequate support. Tie the splints securely, but not so tight as to stop circulation of the blood. Examine the injured part frequently, say every 15 minutes. If the injured part becomes too painful, or circulation is being cut off, loosen the ties around the splint. Now many times there is need of moving an injured person, either because the doctor isn't available or because of the location of the accident. For instance, in the case of a victim who has a fractured forearm, the transportation problem is relatively simple. 
The forearm should be splinted before the victim is moved. However, the transportation of a victim with a more serious fracture presents a greater problem. In fact, the victim should not be moved unless absolutely necessary or under the advice of the doctor. How many times have you read of a well-meaning motorist lifting an injured child from the street? The very way the kind motorist lifts the child, jackknifing the child into his car, may have caused broken ribs to act as jagged spears, which might easily puncture the internal organs. Whenever there is a fracture of the lower limbs or other serious fractures, follow these simple rules. Only after a splint has been applied, use a stretcher. A door or a wide board will do if a stretcher isn't available. Place the victim carefully onto the stretcher, taking great care not to twist or jar the body. Keep him lying flat. When carrying the stretcher, avoid unnecessary jarring or swinging, which might aggravate the injury. Remember, an injured person is at your mercy. Treat him as gently and as kindly as you would like to be treated. Well, you have seen some of the essentials of first aid. Now, this doesn't make a doctor of you, nor a first aid expert. But a knowledge of first aid should enable you, with practice, to relieve suffering and perhaps save a life. Now, when your opportunity will come, or where it'll be, nobody knows. But your help may be wanted, may be needed, at any time. If you have not already done so, enroll for a first aid course and learn how to use your equipment properly. Always keep in mind these simple but important rules to follow before the doctor arrives. Know what to look for. Know what to do. Know how to do it. And when you call a doctor, don't forget to give him some details as to the nature of seriousness of the injury. And if you want to be a really good Samaritan, it's generally a pretty good idea to let the doctor know just where the injured person is.